Welcome to Press Start to Join, a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ETB. This is episode 226, and I'm Alan. I'm Josh. YouTube's given Netflix a run for its money by offering movies on their platform. We've got some interesting news about a DC movie coming out that I want to see. I recommend a board game which gives you the kaiju experience. And I recommend a spiritual successor to all those DDR workouts I did back in high school. First up this week, we have a health alert for everybody. Romaine lettuce is dangerous once again. Health officials have warned that there's been yet another E. coli breakout traced back to romaine lettuce, and it should all definitely be thrown away and avoided at restaurants until further notice. There's definitely like 12 heads of lettuce in my dumpster. I wouldn't doubt it, and I really hope that restaurants are taking this advisory to heart, because there have been already 32 confirmed cases across the US and Canada. Just when I needed to lean into salads before my big pig out birthday dinner. I mean, like, arugula, kale, um, other lettuces that aren't romaine. There's a lot of options out there. And luckily, no deaths as of yet, so fingers crossed we all caught it in time and it's just nip it in the bud. But I'm beginning to think romaine lettuce is a bad idea. (laughs) Just, I don't know, looking at all the E. coli advisories we've had in the last, I don't know, six months? Yeah. But end of the day, just be careful out there, and uh, if you're if you're having any stomach troubles lasting more than three days, or if they're accompanied by a high fever, or blood where there was no blood before, seek medical help. And just wash your vegetables, too. That might well, help. Maybe it's it because romaine has all, like, the, the little wavy bits catching mm, things. Maybe. But, like, you would think that just all the vegetables are washed and all that fun stuff but i don't know just some kind of particles when it was reported i definitely heard stuff like uh it's similar to last year's romaine lettuce scare with Mm -hmm. e coli again it's the same strain yeah wouldn't doubt it i wonder if it's the same producer and they just didn't fix anything probably it wasn't uh they didn't do a big recall last year they just put out a warning Well, and they told everybody to throw it all out and stop selling it, so I think that's... Like, you don't really recall food. You just say, don't eat it. It's garbage now. On to the tech news of the podcast. The rest of that stuff. (laughs) Um, First up, Warframe is on the Switch now, with some annoying caveats. Yeah, but, but what? That's so weird to me. Yeah, so, I mean, first up, Warframe on the Switch looks pretty cool. It, it seems to play solid, and you don't need to pay for Switch Online to play online. Wow. And it officially has headset chat support while in handheld mode without using your phone. So it's better than first-party games that way. Wow. Yeah. Uh, one downside is um, you you are, it isn't cross-platform with your save file. It, it, it doesn't sync your progress between the platforms. What, what it does is you've got your, your PC Warframe profile, and then when you sync it to your Switch, it syncs one way once. Oh. And you end up splitting your account into two, with no way to merge anything back over from the Switch to the PC. So it, it's, it's a little annoying that way, you, but you do end up with just two accounts. Um, apparently this is because the PC and console game versions are separated by about a month of development, so balance changes, tweaks, and things like new items would need a ton of additional work to transfer back across from an older version to a newer one. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So, all this is to say, just be careful if you want to bring your Warframe progress over to the Switch, and just be aware that you are going to end up with two accounts, so you can't just go between the, the two platforms. If you're on the Switch, you're you're stuck on the Switch. But, I mean, all that said, it looks like a lot of fun, and I think it, it translates to the Switch really well. Hmm. Because it is kind of like just quick bite-sized missions, so with, with it being portable, it could be nice, although it does need internet, so how portable that really is, yeah, uh, your mileage may vary. From Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi. Exactly. And then we've got YouTube looking to take a bite out of Netflix with their new streaming service. The new initiative is going to set up streaming for a bunch of movies on YouTube for free with just some added ad breaks. 
They currently have titles like The Terminator, Legally Blonde, Rocky and its sequels, uh, Monsters, and I guess there's a bunch of martial arts and indie films, all kinds of stuff on there. And all in all, it actually sounds pretty interesting. Yeah. Like, I, I wouldn't mind just having a few ads, as long as they're reasonable ads, instead of the however many dollars a month for uh, movies. And with my YouTube premium, hopefully I don't see those ads at all. Yeah, fingers crossed. And I mean, worst case, even if I don't use this service, if nothing else, it's going to spur competition with the other guys. Yeah, because in Canada, we don't have Hulu. So watching mm -hmm. content with ads isn't an option other than by paying for a streaming service. I think we have Crackle. Ugh. But yeah, cr Crackle is a whole weird thing that nothing really good is on it. <laughs> I don't know. It's a weird service. I tried it a few times, and it was just... It seems subpar. Hopefully, YouTube uh, is better than Crackle. <laughs> then again, I mean, maybe it's Canadian Crackle that's subpar. Maybe American Crackle's amazing. But licensing agreements across that one border are just weirdly draconian. <laughs> oh, we've got uh, upcoming DC Universe Birds of Prey movie information now. It officially has a title. Oh. Birds of Prey, Bracket, and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. Eww. It, I don't know, it looks like it could be good. Because that, that's... Brackets well, I, in a title? Yeah, the, um, at least how it was announced was uh, Margot Robbie, Harley Quinn's actress, posted a picture of the, the cover of the screenplay. And it's like, writ, um, it, it's got like Birds of Prey, like in typed, and then in pen... It's like, and the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, and they're like, lipstick kiss, and it seems very on brand for the character. Yeah. Uh, the movie's gonna star, of course, Margot Robbie, reprising her role as Harley from Suicide Squad. Uh, Mary Elizabeth Winst Winstead, who you may know from Fargo or Scott Pilgrim, as Huntress. We've got uh, Journey Smollett Bell uh, from The Great Debaters as Black Canary, and Rosie Perez from Pineapple Express as Renee Montoya. So that's, that's a solid cast and a lot of characters that I really like. We're also going to see Ewan McGregor as Black Mask and newcomer Ella J. Basco as Cassandra Kane. Black Mask is interesting. Black Mask is a cool choice for villain and Cassandra Kane is a really cool character in the comics. It, she's, um, I think she's mute and she's like trained by the League of Assassins or some other like super assassin and becomes Batgirl and it, it's a very cool storyline that I don't know enough about that uh, hmm. I'll be really interesting to see it on the screen because I, I, I need the last volume of Batman No Man's Land and there's someone running around as uh, a, a bat person who's female and isn't speaking so would that be her? That, that's likely Cassandra Cain cool. Do, does she have like D does the mask cover up her mouth? Yes. Yeah, that's that's Cassandra Kane. Neat. I love her. Yeah. So, I mean, all this is adding up to a DC movie that I'm actually <laughs> looking forward to? Uh-oh. I don't understand. I think one of the seals of the apocalypse has, has broken. It, it's weird. Last big news item of the week here, uh, Tumblr was pulled from Apple's App Store this week due to the availability of child pornography on the site. Oh. So that was a thing. Um, in a statement, Tumblr explained that it works closely with partners such as the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children to actively monitor for content uploaded to its platform. It also said that a routine audit revealed content that was not yet included in an industry database of known child sexual abuse material against which Tumblr content is checked. So, once the content was discovered, it was immediately removed, added to the database, and they're looking at further steps they can take to improve the whole process. But the way Apple worded that, it sounds like it's frequent and, like, a place to go for it. Well... Not necessarily, and I, I don't think Apple actually announces why they, they pulled stuff down, because oh. earlier in the week, it was just the Tumblr app disappeared from the App Store for some reason. And and when Apple does stuff like that, they communicate with the developers of why it was pulled. They don't, like, press release it. Yeah. 
so I, I I think the problem was just Apple's reviews noticed that it was available on the app. So they're like, oh, nope, shut that down. That's not allowed. So any app with content you can upload is going to be dinged this way? Well, not necessarily, because it, any any app with content that you can upload where people upload things that are not allowed, like child pornography. It's the same thing with Reddit. There's plenty of Reddit apps. But if there was a child pornography subreddit, Apple would shut that shit down. And I'm sure Reddit would, too, to be honest. Yeah. So it just kind of comes down to um, just policing for what is legal and what is allowed within the guidelines of whatever service you're you're using. Now, th- there's no word on when the Tumblr app might return to the App Store now that the content is apparently gone. But honestly, I'd say this is all kind of just a win for human decency and completely worth the inconvenience. Because <laughs> like, oh, no, I can't get the Tumblr app, but we're stopping child pornography. So that is 100 percent a win. And I will accept the fact that some people can't download the app. Because it's not like it uninstalled people who already had it. Yeah. Or you can still go to Tumblr.com on one of the many web browsers available on the App Store. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So yeah, it's it's not blocking the website entirely. It's just Apple noticed, hey, this app, there is stuff accessible through it that's not cool. So we're removing it. And then Tumblr's like, oh shit, you're right. We're removing that from the site. Thank you for letting us know. <laughs> Today, we'd like to thank the support of Let's Do Coffee. Hosted by Daniel Van Vileen and produced by the Modgy Center for New Venture and Student Entrepreneurship at Nate. Each episode features an interview with a student entrepreneur or Nate alumnus. They dive into topics that explore their challenges, questions, and fears involved in operating their companies. New episodes come out every two weeks. You can find the show at nate.ca slash Center. That's nate.ca slash M-A-W-J-I Center. And with that, we're on to the tidbits of the week. First up, uh, there may be a new Xbox One S coming with no disk drive, targeting the sub-$200 console market. Nice. Sources are saying that it's going to be targeting a spring 2019 launch, but there's no official news from Microsoft, so take that with a grain of salt. One thing to note is it is the Xbox One S. So it will have all the the limited 4K functionality of the S, none of the superpowers of the X. Mm -hmm. News from Nintendo is, according to Reggie Fizzimi, there are no plans for an N64 Classic in the near future. Oh. Apparently the previous Classic consoles were seen as limited time opportunities to bridge from the Wii U to the Switch. And... Honestly, plus that that weird Trident controller would probably add some extra complications to manufacturing. Yeah. Because like NES controller, rectangle box, done. SNES controller, rounded rectangle box, done. N64 controller, why? It immediately like (laughs) doubles the packaging size. Because they would Um, probably include two, as they have been. I, I would honestly say an N64 controller is the size of a classic console and its controllers in box, all said and done. Like, N64 controller boxes were about the size of these classic edition boxes. Yeah. They were not small. Looking at the controller, I definitely see what you mean. Yeah, like, they're, there's a lot to them and a lot of wasted empty space. So, I don't know how they would uh, get around that. I could almost see them releasing... Like, I don't know if they if they could, because it's, then it's not so much a classic if they modify the controller, right? But yeah. theoretically, you could do everything you could with an N64 controller with, like, a GameCube controller. And that's still, like, a half to a third the size. So there's options there, but then it loses the nostalgia factor, and I don't know. Cool news from Hello Games, uh, No Man's Sky is continuing to bring us free updates, making good on the promises that it made way back when the hype train just kind of went wild. This latest one is called Visions, and besides the usual new aesthetics and additions to the procedural planet formula, we're also going to see mysterious artifacts and ancient alien bones. Neat! So you can get your archaeology on. And last but certainly not least... 
We have wishing a very happy 20th birthday to the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Nice. It it really feels like it took what Super Mario 64 was trying to do, translating a 2D world into 3D, and did it in a way that still really holds up. Like if, if, if you look at the re-release for the 3DS, it basically smoothed out the graphics and didn't do a lot much else to update it. And it's just Ocarina of Time was a good game and it, it continues to be a good game. Plus it paved the way for Majora's Mask, which is my favorite Zelda. Yeah, I definitely, the story is what kept me in Majora's Mask for sure. Yeah, like the, the, the world of Majora's Mask is so weird and off-putting and amazing in, in the strangest ways. And we could not have had it without Ocarina of Time. Because I honestly thought that might it might have been um, Twilight Princess be my favorite, but with the re-release that came out, I couldn't get into it. Oh, yeah? Yeah, the, the Wii U update, it was just something about it. I was just so bored with it and just couldn't continue. Maybe I was yeah, in a bad headspace and got to try it again or something. It could be worth revisiting. I know personally, I never finished Twilight Princess the first time. It it really felt like an overcorrection from Wind Waker, mm. and and it went. It was very brown, yeah, and very grim. And I'm like, that's not like Majora's Mask is grim in an entirely like fever dream colorful way, and I love it. Versus Twilight Princess is just like brown and dark and I don't know. It it got us Midna though. Midna's great. Like there's a lot of great characters. Yeah. Just something about Twilight Princess isn't as good. I don't know. To me, personally. And then they did, anyway, they did those like battle arenas, sort of like uh, Okami does. When the enemies would spawn, it'd make that circle, and you have to fight within that circle with the uh, Twilight Beasts. Oh, yeah, for those specific enemies. Yeah, and then you had to like do that, that charge-up maneuver to like kill them all in a single thing. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. It was, it was an interesting... Uh, it was an interesting foray, and probably a lot of those mechanics informed later Zeldas. Like, we wouldn't have gotten Breath of the Wild without every single Zelda previous. It all it all feeds into the, the future games. and Yeah. So it's all cool that way. Anyway, to celebrate the uh, birthday of Ocarina of Time, why not check out our very first history episode we did back in episode 105. Wow. All about the legend of The Legend of Zelda. Yeah, that's before we got the format for uh, his gaming history stuff. Mm-hmm. And fair warning, we also uh, had a little bit of audio issues, so that's the one ep- history episode where my audio is just kind of jacked up. And we learned but, from our, ex- our uh, yeah. mistakes. And and all the other episodes are good. <laughs> hey, if we hit uh, a bunch of Patreon subscribers, why don't we re-record that? <laughs> Oh, yeah, that could be fun. I could do all new reactions, because I don't remember anything you said. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gift you have, Alan. It, some may call it a gift. <laughs> <laughs> it lets me reread books very frequently, that's for sure. <laughs> this episode is brought to you in part by Park Power, a provider of electricity and natural gas in Alberta that offers low rates, awesome service, and profit sharing with local charities. In Alberta, you get to choose who to buy your energy from. Park Power has low overhead, and the chances are you'll save money if you switch. You can find out just how much money you'd save by visiting parkpower.ca and plugging your numbers into the Alberta Energy Savings Calculator. And if you decide to switch, it's easy. Nothing changes about your service, only the price you pay, and the charities that get a portion of your money. Learn more over at parkpower.ca. But now, before we get into recommendations, it's that time where we ask you to rate and review us on whatever podcast platform uh, you might be listening to us on. All that really helps with vis- visibility and gets us into more ears. And if you want to drop us a line on social media, we're at PS2J Show everywhere. We've got Twitter, we've got Instagram, Facebook. Uh, if you've got any hot tips for us, you can let us know at PS2J Show at gmail.com. And then, of course, ps2jshow.com has all of our episodes. It's searchable by tags. It's got comment sections. Uh, it's got links to our Discord, so you can come chat with us and play games with us. And it's got links to our Patreon if you want to uh, get some secret bonus content and just help us make more and better shows. 
Yeah, we post show notes to the Patreon that are available after the episode launches on our website because RSS feed subscribers do get it a little early. And if you're on our Discord, I let people know when I upload it so you can listen to it right away. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Also, one thing to keep in mind is just a quick reminder that we are taking December off for the holidays. So December 1st will be our last episode of 2018, and then we'll see you fresh and early back in 2019. Yeah, that'll be PSUJ228 is the last one of the year. Good times. So let's have a, uh, a Christmas special or something. Yeah, that could be fun. We don't do specials. It's something we should try doing. It's hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Keep up with everything and do specials on top of that. But I said 228, and this is only 226, because we get the last History of Gaming of the Year coming out right away. Oh, yeah, and it's a good one. Yeah, it is pretty good. I've It's nearly complete, and it's going to be uploaded probably this weekend. So Nice. As always, a big thank you to the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ETB, without whom a lot of this would not be possible can check them out and all the great podcasts that are members of the network over at albertapodcastnetwork.com. And a big thanks to Kevin McLeod. He's the soundtrack to the internet and our podcast because we I use I use Kevin McLeod for our backing tracks for everything. And uh, being a Patreon subscriber of his, I learned that some people are making a little documentary of him. So I find that really cool and I'll keep everyone updated if it comes out. Very cool. And he's at incomptech.com. So before we wrap up this bite-sized press start to join, uh, Josh, what do you have a recommendation for us this week? It's a game I got to teach just the other night, and it's King of New York. Oh, yeah, that's a, that was a lot of fun. Because I haven't played it in a long time before we uh, taught Sam at Level Up Game Escape in Sherwood Park. You can Google it easy. She's nice enough to invite us over, and we teach her games and play games she's played and everything it's a lot mm-hmm. of fun but king of new york definitely is a more active experience where the king of tokyo has the sort of problem of its pvp only and everyone's either outside or inside tokyo fighting each other yeah definitely new york adds the there's burrows and you get to hop around uh, a chunk of new york and destroy buildings and every time you destroy something military shows up and the powers seem a lot more interactive than in King of Tokyo. Mm-hmm. But that is also noting I have not played the reprint of King of Tokyo, which I've heard good things about. I have the original, not like the first print, but I have the original uh, before they updated everything. Oh, okay. But I'm looking forward to checking out King of New York's uh, Power Up expansion because... Now that I've played it a couple more times, I might get an expansion for it if it's cheap on, like, Black Friday or something. Very cool. And my recommendation this week is Beat Saber on the PSVR. It's nice. it's so much fun. It is... It, I talked about it on Twitter already, and I'm just going to rip what I said on there. It's yeah. like DDR and Fruit Ninja had a child, gave it a couple lightsabers, and set it loose in VR. Um, yeah, it, it's just blocks fly at you that you have to cut with a particular hand in a particular direction, and then it all kind of feeds into the music that plays through each level. So it, it gets really intuitive, like you're, you're swinging your, your, your move controllers with the beat. And it, it's just it's such simple gameplay that is so satisfying and really fun when you get into a groove and get fully immersed in, in the gameplay. And plus, bonus, it's a solid cardio workout. Yeah. Like I, I ended up playing for like, I don't know, probably an hour, hour and a half my first time. And then I took off the headset. I'm like, whoops, I'm sweaty. <laughs> um, one suggestion, if you want uh, to get a little shoulder and arm strength, get like three pound uh, wrist weights and strap them around your wrists. Just to add that... a little more resistance. Well, because it, it's already the scoring incentivizes big broad yeah. swings because you need like 90 degrees before you cut and 60 degrees after yeah and that's so why th- I, I that's why i said such a low weight of three pounds because you're gonna Honestly, be moving fast yeah well even just like a few hours over a couple days I, my biceps are still burning and that's <laughs> without weights <laughs> 
So I don't, I, I'm not exactly in the best shape, but I have been doing the rower fairly re frequently for the last like couple months. So I'm not out of shape. So this is like just a good workout overall, but I might look into those weights if, uh, if it gets too easy for me in the future. The coolest trainer I ever had was, you know, I'm not too picky about the exercise you're doing as long as you're breaking a sweat. Yep, exactly. And with Beat Saber, one, one note is that the song selection is a little limited on the PSVR at the moment. I think it's got like less than 20 different songs. But there's going to be more packs coming in the future, some free, some paid. And uh, if you play it on the PC instead, with I can't remember if it's Vive or Oculus, but one of the PC VRs, um, there's a bunch of custom songs available with ah. varying quality. Of course. What, one, one advantage to the first party songs is you know they're all curated and really good and satisfying movements versus whatever the, the custom songs, whatever they kind of throw together. Yeah, that sort of game sound like it would be fun, like you brought up DDR, where everybody just shows up and you're trying to outdo each other with the last song. Yeah. Well, I, I was looking at the game modes and there is a party mode for Beat Saber. I oh. don't know what it does because I don't have enough friends, <laughs> but uh, I'd love to give it a shot and get some people over. Well, that's why we definitely brought it up when we were at Level Up Game Escape, because they have two PlayStation VRs now. This is true, but you also need, like, <laughs> a good six-foot circle minimum to stand in, because you're going to be a-swinging. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you won't be... Bo oh, I guess you have to duck and lean, right? Yeah, you have to duck, lean, and, and some of them do make you reach. Plus, just the fact that you get immersed in the VR environment, yeah. so you're going to be making like wild swings in random directions, and people are not going to know what you're doing next. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. But I think that's going to do it for this week. So, as always, thank you all at home very much for listening. And thanks for pressing start.